Hey, New Life, it's great to be able to join you again today. And as you can probably see, I'm joining you from Coffee at New Life, our fantastic cafe here at New Life Gold Coast. And I'm really excited this, this coming week with some restrictions, we're going to be able to see Coffee at New Life open up uh, again. And uh, so all the wonderful food, but more particularly the wonderful people here at Coffee New Life are going to be able to serve you. Uh, Marlene, Androa, Mecca, Jordan and the rest of the team. So watch our social media just to find out more about that. Uh, I, I know that they will love to be able to greet you, welcome you and offer you their fantastic hospitality. You know, uh, 15 years ago this July, uh, Sue and I, uh, together with Joel and Emily, went on our first overseas trip. Uh, we travelled to uh, for two weeks to Thailand, then two weeks in Vietnam. It was our first big overseas adventure together, our first passports, all of that. And we had a wonderful time, two weeks in Thailand with our friends uh, who were working as missionaries there, and, and then two, week on a, two weeks on a small group tour in Vietnam. And by the time we got to Vietnam, I, I felt like we were experienced overseas travellers. And so we flew into Hanoi. And we had one night before we picked up our small group tour the next morning. And so we booked into our hotel, uh, we left our luggage, and then we excitedly went out into the streets to explore this new wonderful city. And we had a fantastic time. We just wandered the streets, uh, looking at all the sights, taking in all the smells, the sounds, etc. And then it started to get dark. Like the sort of dark it is when there's little or no street lights. And then I realized that we didn't have a map. And then I realized that I had left the hotel without taking one of those little cards that had the unpronounceable name of the hotel where we were staying. And then I told Sue that effectively we were in a strange city in a new country with no idea where we were or where our home was. She may have been a little bit annoyed. And so the four of us, we started to stumble around in the dark, uh, trying to find our way back home, desperately looking for a familiar landmark um, that would give us some indication that we were somewhere near the hotel that we could barely remember. Uh, at one point, about an hour or so, it was now pitch dark, we, we came to a street uh, that was totally, the only thing that was on sale was chickens. Chickens as far as the eye could see. If I could read Vietnamese, I'm sure it said Chicken Street. And that was okay. There's just hundreds, thousands of chickens everywhere. That would have been okay, except this, this was at the height of the avian flu scare. Now Sue wasn't just annoyed, she was angry because I was endangering her babies at this point. We stumbled on. And eventually, miraculously, uh, we barely recognised our hotel and after an hour and a half or so, collapsed inside. The next morning, we met our small tour group. We met Sunny, our guide. And for the next two weeks, from Hanoi at the top down to Ho Chi Minh in the south, Sunny became our guide into Vietnamese culture and food and uh, the geography, the culture of the place. It was a fantastic two weeks. Now last week uh, we continued our series exploring the book of Acts and we discovered that the Holy Spirit is our battle partner. And we were exploring the question, how does the Holy Spirit strengthen us? And we looked at the story of this remarkable man who demonstrated just amazing courage, a man called Stephen. And this week the question we're going to be addressing is, how does the Holy Spirit guide us? Here's what I learned in Vietnam 15 years ago. Adventures are best lived with a guide. And the Holy Spirit, he's certainly our, 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 our battle partner, but the Holy Spirit, what I hope we'll discover today, is also our travel guide. Well, how? How is the Holy Spirit our travel guide? We're going to explore that through the story, uh, not of Stephen this week, but of the Apostle Paul. And as I hope we will see, the Holy Spirit interrupts our plans, illuminates the scriptures, and number three, he ignites our faith. First of all, the Holy Spirit interrupts our plans. Now Saul, of course, he was the man who was holding the cloaks of those who stoned Stephen to death. Saul was the man who led the first great persecution against the church, scattering the disciples to the four winds. Saul was the man who, on the road to Damascus, had this blinding encounter with the risen Jesus, 
transforming him in an instant. And Saul, the persecutor, became Paul, the apostle. Scroll forward about a decade and Paul, the apostle, is also a church planner. He's a missionary. He's sent out from his home base in Antioch and he and Barnabas travel through what we know as modern day Turkey where they plant and establish churches as they preach the gospel in different places, towns and villages and cities. And eventually they return back to Antioch and almost as soon as they're back, Paul is planning his second missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas have a falling out and so it's now Paul and Silas who set off together. Again, going to look, looking to strengthen the churches and the converts that they've helped establish in the faith, but also to preach the gospel in new places. And as they leave Antioch, along the way, they pick up a young man called Timothy, who Paul begins to mentor in the faith. And their, their plans are, are to travel up into Turkey and then south and west down towards Ephesus, the port, the very important Roman port city. Uh, but as they get up to the centre of what we know as modern day Turkey, and as they look to turn south and west towards Ephesus, their plans are thwarted. This is what we read in Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Paul and his companions travelled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. The door had been closed to Ephesus and Asia Minor, down in that southwestern region of what we know as Turkey. So Paul was undaunted. He continued on. He continued northwards and his plan changed. It it, it adapted and his plans was to travel north and east now into the province of Bithynia. But this is what we read in the next verse in, in Acts chapter 16, verse 7. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Not just one door got closed, but now a second door was closed in front of them. We don't know. How was it the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, closed these doors? What was it that stopped Paul and Silas and Timothy and their companions from going to the places they had planned to go? Was it a prophetic word? Was it an impression? Was there some sort of physical barrier? Was there some circumstance that stopped them? We simply do not know. What we do know is that Luke, our narrator, he well and truly establishes that that this closed door was a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit closed the door, ordering Paul's steps. The Holy Spirit was Paul's ultimate travel guide. But Paul continues on. (laughs) He's a missionary after all. And that night, as he goes to sleep, he has a vivid dream. And in this dream, a man who identifies himself as a man from Macedonia, what we'd know today as modern day Greece, or not in the province of Asia, but on the continent of Europe, is calling out to Paul, inviting him, desperately begging him to come and to meet with him. This is what we read in 16, Acts 16, verse 9. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia to help us. Paul's plan was Asia Minor. Then his plan changed to Bithynia, but God's plan was Europe. And so the next morning, Paul and his companions, they set sail from the continent of Asia for the continent of Europe. They land there. They quickly travel to Philippi. And there in Philippi, Paul meets a woman, a wealthy merchant called Lydia, a God-fearing woman down by the river preaches the gospel and she's converted and the church is established in that city. But not just in that city, Paul and his companions, they continue on from Philippi to Thessalonica to Athens and to Corinth. And wherever they go, the gospel is preached and churches are planted. The Holy Spirit interrupts plans. Sometimes the Holy Spirit closes one door and then opens another. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I love how he puts it. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will be constantly crossing our paths and cancelling our plans. Sue and I have experienced this again and again. Around the time we were married, we were 22 years of age, we were part of a house church. 
Uh, we helped establish it, uh, three other couples, four couples together. And the plan that we have was to replant an inner city church in Adelaide, a church called St. Stephen's. And so we met together weekly planning. And Sue and I actually rented our first flat. The first place we lived together was down in that suburb in order that we might minister to the people in that place and help re-establish the church that had dwindled down to a few in that place. We were excited. We were full of vision and dreams and plans. And everything was going really well for a long time. And then, and I can't even remember the details of it, but the, 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 the four couples, we, we together, you know, we, we loved one another. We enjoyed each other's company, but things got a little bit funky. Our vision started to get a little bit blurry. Some of us had a different idea about what this would look like from others. And it all came to a head one night. I can still remember it when we decided that it was right for us to, to let go of the dream, to let go of the vision that, that God was closing the door. And I remember at the time feeling like it was an awful failure on our part. But here's what happened immediately afterwards, in the year or so afterwards. For Sue and I, um, we ended up uh, buying our first house in the outer suburbs of Adelaide. And we moved to a new church. Uh, in that church, we were asked within a couple of months to lead a youth group. And over the next three years, we saw dozens and dozens of young people come to faith in Jesus Christ and be filled with the Holy Spirit. God did a remarkable thing. Our idea was to replant an, an inner suburban church. God's idea was for us to lead an outer suburban youth ministry. Another couple, Scott and Rachel, who are great friends of ours, uh, they were both at university at the time and Rachel was studying for physiotherapy and she had to do a placement. And so we in the small group had uh, provided the funds for her to do a placement uh, in Thailand working with a mission organisation and while she was there Scott and Rachel sensed the call from God to serve in the mission field and for the next 20 years in the hills of Thailand in, in the slums of Bangkok into the cities of Cambodia that's what Scott and Rach did with their family one door closed another door opened uh, another couple in that group Craig and Kay uh, soon after, went on to the staff of a suburban, large suburban church, and eventually Craig and Kay became senior pastors of that church, leading thousands. One door closed, another door opened. Craig Rochelle, he says this, Our greatest disappointments often lead to God's divine appointments. You know, our plan was to revive an inner city church in Adelaide, but God's will for us was different. He had different doors that he was wanting us to walk through. And our disappointment led to a divine appointment. Now, I look back now, I couldn't see it then, but this was the work of the Holy Spirit. And here's what I've come to discover. If I have eyes to see, if I have a spirit to perceive, then an interruption will often offer an invitation. And with God, one door closed can lead to a better door opening. This was Paul's experience. He wanted to go to Asia Minor, then to Bithynia, but he ends up going to Europe and we see what happens, the miracle after miracles that happen after that. This was Paul's experience and this has been my testimony. And so... <laughs> For those of you who might have been experiencing in this season doors being closed one after the other, rather than focus on the door that is closed, we must lament and grieve it, I know. Perhaps we should be asking the Holy Spirit to show us the door that he's inviting us to open and to walk through. The Holy Spirit is our travel guide. He interrupts our plans. The Holy Spirit is our travel guide and he illuminates scripture. You know, one of the companions that was with uh, Paul was a young man called Timothy. And a decade or so later, Timothy is leading his own churches and, and, and Paul writes to him and in, that, in, in his letter, his second letter to Timothy, he famously says this in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, all scripture is God breathed. Here's the interesting thing. The, the word God breathed is translated from a Greek word and that Greek word is theopneustos. 
Theopneustos. It's a compound word. It's, it's the coming together of the word theos, which means God, and the word pneuma, which means spirit or breath. And here's the interesting thing about this. This is the only place in the scriptures, Old and New Testament, where this word is used. In fact, scholars can't find this word anywhere else in ancient Greek writing. It's almost as if perhaps Paul has made up the word. He's constructed the word himself to communicate a compelling truth. What Paul is saying to Timothy and what he's saying to us, the scriptures, the Bible that we have, that we can hold in our hands or read on our screens, the scriptures are God-breathed and made alive and animated by the Holy Spirit. You know, when I, when I read this phrase that all scripture is God-breathed, I, I can't help but think of... The Genesis story, the creation story in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, you know, we read that 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 God breathes his breath into the formed clay of man and and, and man comes to life, is animated into life. And in the same way, God breathed through those who wrote the scripture and through their hand, through their words, breathes these words into life. These are not just dead words on a page. They are living and active. The writer of Hebrews says this. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double edged sword. Some of you, I know, are longing to encounter the Holy Spirit. Well, I've got a guaranteed way that you can. Open your Bible. Read your Bible prayerfully and with expectation. Ask God to speak to you through the words of Scripture. You see, when I open the Bible, when I read my Bible prayerfully and expectantly, I encounter the Holy Spirit. The words on the page, as I allow them to, they leap off the page and into my heart and into my spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminates Scripture. And through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, my travel guide, guides me on my inward journey as I become more like Jesus. The scriptures we have are all that we need for the training in righteousness, Paul tells Timothy. But they also guide me on my outward journey, on my adventure of faith. Time and time again, God has breathed the word of scripture into my life. A word in season that has guided myself and Sue and our family in the adventure that he's calling us into. The psalmist, he says it this way. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Now, sometimes when I'm walking around the property here with Sue at night and we, we're in a, in a, in a place uh, where there's little light and we have to look for something on the ground, often I'll reach for my phone, as many of you would do, and I would, I, I'll switch on uh, the little torch that is part of the, the software that, that runs this phone and, and I'm able to illuminate at least just a little bit of uh, uh, the ground that's in front of me. In a similar way, when I get up in the morning after I take my phone off the charge and I ask God to fill me with his Holy Spirit, when I open up the Bible and prayerfully read, God illuminates my path in this wonderful, compelling, mysterious way for the day ahead. Giving me a word in season, enough to illuminate my path for that day and the next day and the next day and the next day. The Holy Spirit is our travel guide. He interrupts our plans. He illuminates scripture. The Holy Spirit is our travel guide and he ignites our faith. Now, Paul encountered these two closed doors uh, as he was on his missionary journey. And, and the Holy Spirit gives him a, a, a dream of an open door, a door into Europe through Macedonia, through Philippi. And this is what we read in Luke's account in Acts chapter 16, verse 10, after he receives that dream. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Here's the thing about Paul. There was no lamenting closed doors, no grieving over cancelled plans. 
But once he has this dream, he knows God is up to something. If he's closed those doors, God must have another plan. An open door appears in front of him. And without delay, with no hand wringing, without any procrastination, and with God-given faith, Paul steps out believing, expecting, anticipating. You know, here's the thing. Cancelled plans, they make for great kindling where the flame of faith can be lit. Let me say that again. Cancelled plans make for great kindling where the flame of faith can be lit. The Holy Spirit is our travel guide and he opens more doors than he closes. The Holy Spirit, as he opens a door, ignites our faith to walk through them. You see, faith is not just an emotion. It's not an emotion we feel. It's not something we can manufacture. Faith is a gift, a gift of the Spirit to receive, not an emotion to manufacture. One of my favourite stories of women and men of faith is a story of Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael was uh, the daughter of devout Irish Presbyterians. She grew up in the 19th century. She became a Christian at the age of 15, and when she was 20 years of age, uh, she um, went to a rally where she heard the great Hudson Taylor, the, the pioneer of mission, uh, gospel mission to China, heard him preach and call people to the mission field. And she sensed in that moment as a 20-year-old young woman a call to the mission field. Here's the thing about Amy Carmichael. She'd lived for many years already and would live for the rest of her lives with a, with a chronic ki- uh, condition called neuralgia, which was a painful nerve condition that would leave her debilitated and in much pain and often bedridden for days. And, and so for two years, she, she trained for the mission field. And after two years, it was established that she was too unwell to actually travel there. But she was undaunted. That door closed. And so she looked for another open door. She went to another mission organisation, the Church and Missionary Society. And she trained with them and they sent her off to Japan. But it's almost as soon as she got to Japan, she became so ill, they sent her back home again. Another door closed. But undaunted, she looked for another door. And this time she was sent to Sri Lanka. But again, when she arrives in Sri Lanka, she becomes very, very ill, debilitatingly so. And rather than send her home, the mission organisation sent her to another place where she could convalesce. They sent her to Bangalore in southern India and a door opened. And after years of disappointments and closed doors, the door that opened to her in Bangalore allowed her first of all to convalesce there and then to discover her vocation. Because Amy Carmichael never left Bangalore. For the next 50 years, that's where she lived and ministered. While she was there convalescing, she became uh, acquainted with the plight of, of young girls who were temple prostitutes in the Hindu temples of the city. Girls who were not yet in their teens, who were sold into sexual slavery. And she reached out to them with the love of Jesus, proclaiming the gospel in both word and deed, caring for their needs and rescuing them from their oppression. And for the next 50 years, that's what she did. She saved thousands of young girls, extended a whole range of other ministries to that city in the name of Jesus. In 1948, three years before she died, and all through her years in Bangalore, she suffered with great pain and debilitating illness. In 1948, three years before she died, the practice of temple prostitution was outlawed by the Indian state. After years of one door closing, after another door closing, after another door closing, God opens the door to her lifelong calling. Amy Carmichael wrote 30 or 40 books. In one of her books, she wrote this. It is a safe thing to trust him to fulfil the desires that he creates. You know, I think of this story, the testimony, the witness of Amy Carmichael, I think of the words of the writer of Proverbs who says this, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. The Lord established the steps of Amy Carmichael, of Paul the Apostle, and countless thousands, millions, hundreds of millions of other believers down through the centuries, 
and he can for you too as your travel guide. The Holy Spirit is our battle partner. The Holy Spirit is our travel guide. The Holy Spirit interrupts plans, illuminates scripture. The Holy Spirit ignites faith. You know, our world, not just now, but at different times, is marked by interruption and disappointment. And more profoundly, by pain and by suffering. Doors are closed, plans are cancelled. And many of us have experienced more of that in this season than perhaps any other season in our lives. Or certainly there's a surge of that. Cancelled plans and disappointments. Uh, late last year, I was introduced to an acronym, a term that is used by military strategists and leadership experts in uh, North America. The acronym is VUCA, V-U-C-A, and it stands for these four words, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, describing our world. A world of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. A world of closed doors and plan cancelled plans. And I don't know about you, but I feel like we do actually live in many ways in a VUCA world. But here's what I also know. We don't have to navigate this VUCA world alone. When I think of the story of the Apostle Paul, what we've read today, I read of a man who found himself immersed in a VUCA world on steroids. There was so much uncertainty, volatility, complexity and ambiguity. But Paul had and we have ourselves a travel guide, a battle partner. One who can guide us through and strengthen us on the way. In a VUCA world, God can and will order your steps. And so, in this season you find yourself in, that interruption may well be an invitation. Will you look for it? That disappointment may well lead to your destiny. Do you believe it? That cancelled plan may well be the kindling where faith can and will be ignited. Are you ready for it? And that God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired word that you can find in Scripture can illuminate your path. Will you read it and drink in from its depths? Before we sing our last song, I want to give an opportunity for those of us who've never taken that first step of living an adventure with God to do exactly that. Now, there's a lot of things I don't know, but there's one thing I do know. The biggest adventure you can live in this world is a life lived with God. How can we do that? Well, we simply come to the one who surrendered himself for us and surrender our life in return. And the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. So in a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you would like to live an adventure with God, if you'd like to surrender your life to him and begin that first step on that adventure for the rest of your life into eternity, then pray this prayer with me. In this prayer, we're going to ask God to forgive us for our past. We're going to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, that he is God and that he is ruler of our life. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to empower and equip us for the future. So let's pray together. Will you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the life you lived the death you died, and the victory you won through your resurrection. We acknowledge you as God. Today we confess that we have failed, that we've messed up, that many of the disappointments we've experienced have been at our own hand. God, forgive us our sin. We acknowledge you as Lord, as Saviour. We surrender our life to you. Lead us 
on the adventure of faith that you're calling us into. Holy Spirit, fill us. Empower, strengthen and guide us, we pray. Father, we pray that you would order our steps. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer for the first time today, hallelujah, that is awesome. But we would love to have a conversation with you about the decision that you have made and talk to you about the next step after this one. And on the screen at the bottom, there's a banner which you can click, which will connect you directly to one of our pastors. Or there's a number on the screen as well that you can text with your name and the word Jesus. If you text through to that number, we will be back in contact with you as soon as possible. Again, to talk to you about next steps. It's so important that you connect with someone in this moment and we invite you to do so. But for now, let's join together in worship as we sing to the God to whom we look, the one who is our travel guide. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom You know just what to do Days, I will love you, God. 
such a joy to spend this time with you and my prayer for you this week is that the Holy Spirit would be your strength and your guide your ongoing and forever companion and as we finish I, I want to leave you with a benediction the words of someone far more eloquent than I But before I do that I just want to encourage you after the benediction if you're looking for other ways in which you can connect with us online uh, together to have conversation after one of our celebrations then just stay on and there'll be some more information shared with you about that but for now let me share with you our final blessing wherever you go God is sending you wherever you are God has put you there God has a purpose in your being right where you are Christ who indwells you by the power of his spirit wants to do something in and through you. Believe this and go in his grace, his love, his power, in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all together, wherever we are, we say, Amen.